Well, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. As we are marching onward to our, our end, we only have uh, nine, is it nine more chapters we got? Nine more chapters after, after this one uh, to finish up Matthew. I'm, I'm excited to, to be moving right along. I want to start back in, in Matthew chapter 17. And um, you just flip the page over, Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to start with verse number 22. And we're going to read all the way through verse number 5 of Matthew chapter 18. These are sort of intertwined, and uh, you know that because it says in the very first verse of chapter 18, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, so all this is happening at the, at the same time. And we need to know that as we're looking at the circumstances that are taking place. It says in, in Matthew 17, verse number 22, it says, And while they abode in, in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed in, in the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be risen again and they were exceedingly sorrow and when they were come to Capernaus they that received tribute money came to Peter and said doth not your master pay tribute he said yes and when his and when he was come into the house Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom does the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, Of strangers. Jesus said unto, unto him, Then are the children free, notwithstanding, lest we should off, uh, uh, offend them, Go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take it, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give to them for me and thee. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as a little children as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall shall humble himself as a little child, the same is great in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much for your good grace and mercy. And Lord, I pray, God, that you'll help us tonight as we gather around your word, Lord, and, and, and look into it for uh, understanding. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as we look and, and deal with certain uh, themes and subjects, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us remembrance of what we studied and read, and, and Lord, in past sermons that have been preached, and, and things that I've attained through the years, Lord, that you would bring them to mind, and Lord, that you'd help us to be closer and drawn closer to thee. And Lord, we, I do humble myself before you realize that I'm just a man in need of thee, and Lord, I pray, God, that you'd use me for thy honor and glory. I love you and thank you for all you do, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a great picture here, of, uh, which we, we're not actually going to preach on, but Peter, as he, as he is, is sort of torn, uh, it's really interesting to me that he made a commitment of the Lord without the Lord's permission. Uh, he, he, and they came to him and asked him, does, uh, the, does your master, don't your master pay tribute? And 
Peter says, sure, yeah, he does. And then when he comes into the room, I mean, Jesus don't ask him, where you been? He don't ask him what's been going on. He, he simply starts dealing with the problem that's in Peter's heart. Because he's, he's torn with what's taking place. And Jesus reveals to him that even though that we're free, that we're not of this world, that we're still to abide by the laws of this world. He gives, he gives that plainly to Peter that, that, listen, we as children of God, we're free, but, but we're not free to, to rebel against the, what's going on in the world, but to submit ourselves to it. That's a hard thing to do sometimes. It really is, especially when we're governed by wicked people. It's hard to submit unto the laws of the land when you know that those that are, that are enforcing the laws of the land are wicked people. And can I tell you, it was the same in Peter's time. The Roman government in that time was not somebody that was nice or, or kind or, or was thinking about your best interests or anything like that. Uh, they, they had one objective, and that was to rule the world at any cost. But the, the portion that I want us to look at tonight is not, not Peter and, and the incident that's going on, but the other, the other thing that is taking place. I mean, there's several things that are taking place, but the, the one thing that's taking place, the disciples, they have been in a, in a desiresome um, power grab, if you will. They want to know who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Which of us 12, Lord? I mean, that's almost like what they were saying. Which of us 12 are going to be, are going to be the greatest in the kingdom? It's got to be one of us. I mean, it's got to be one. I mean, we're the ones that you've chosen. One of us has got to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. What a power. I mean, you know, what, 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 a, what a mindset they had. And it's very interesting to me how the Lord deals with this. And he gives them an illustration of a little child. And, you know, it could be that, that, that you know, it hadn't been long ago that Peter had been rebuked by Jesus too, you know. He'd, he'd been rebuked by Jesus and said, get thee behind me, Satan. So, I mean, it might have been that all the other you know, 11 and mark Peter off and say, well, Peter's not going to be it because he, he's already become a child of Satan. And, I mean, you know, just that fast. And they thought that, hey, now we've got a real chance. You know, we're knocking them off. I mean, you know, that, they, wanted, they wanted that place, that position. But the desire, some, I mean, the desire that they had, Jesus had to show them that, hey, listen, it all comes down to a little child, a little child. So Jesus sees this, this desire that they have, and he, he has to deal with it promptly, and, it, and he does so, and he launches into this, the, this entire chapter of 18, and he teaches them about childlikeness, behavior. He, he brings them to a a childlikeness behavior, because I want you to understand something. I know that we are all in here are considered adults. But can I tell you, in our, in our understanding and in our, our dealing with spiritual things, all of us here are like children. There's none of us here that are mature. I just want you to realize that. I was listening to Jay Vernon McGee the other day, and he said, I've been, I've been preaching for 50 years. He said, and i just come to understand that I'm ignorant to the Word of God. After 50 years of studying the Word of God, he come to the understanding that he was ignorant to it. Boy, I tell you what, can I tell you, that's a, that, that right there puts him in a place of understanding that most of us have never got to. But Jesus launches as he deals with these. And he starts off, if you look at verse number two, and he calls a little child. Jesus calls a little child to him and he sets him in the midst of them. And he's, he's preparing the position to teach. I mean, he is getting them ready. 
And I, I believe that, I honestly believe that all 12 are there. I don't believe that Peter had left yet. I believe this is at the same time that, that all this is taking place with Peter. And I believe that Peter is there too because this is definitely a lesson that Peter needs. There's no doubt. I mean, Peter is always the one that puts his foot in his mouth first. He is the one that, that jumps ahead of everybody else. He, he definitely needs to know what the Lord's fixing to teach. And so the Lord gathers in his arms there the little toddler or the little infant. That's what the word means, uh, little child. It means infant. And you can imagine this little child looking at the, the wonderful eyes and the, of the face of the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. The the peacefulness that is there amongst them as, he, as they're there. The beautifulness and the majesty of our Lord that, 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 that they're experiencing. Such innocence, such weakness, such confidence and such trust is the perfect illustration for our Lord to use. And so Jesus sets them in his arms, embraces that little child. And I, I cannot help but think that how many times Jesus used little children in his presence. And we've already been, or already seen in Matthew chapter 14 that they were used there and in Matthew chapter 15 and now in Matthew chapter 18. And we'll see them again in chapter 19 and chapter 21 and chapter 23. Jesus loved children. He loved them. And he, he liked them in, their, in his presence always. I'll be honest with you. One of the things that I, I believe that, uh, that we as a church have a hard time realizing is that in the midst of the congregation, we need children. And uh, we, I believe one of the downfalls of the church is dividing the children apart from the adults. I really believe that. Even though that's something that we do, and one of the reasons we do is because we don't have the parents of the children that are with us. But there's five lessons in this chapter. And they're all about child likeness and behavior. The whole chapter is about children, how they enter into the kingdom with, with uh, childlike faith, in verse number 3 and 4, and how they are treated like children, verse number 5 through 9, and how they are to be cared for like children, verses number 10 through 14, and how they are to be disciplined like children, verses 15 through 20, and then how they are to be forgiven like children, in verses 21 through 35. And so we're, we're going to begin today uh, sort, of, sort of the first portion of this, but there's some things that we need to uh, really look at to be able to get a great understanding of this. And this is what I want to do tonight is sort of to give us a foundation to look more into it next week as we look into this lesson. So as we look into this, we're looking in verses number 3 and 4. Now listen very carefully to what it says as uh, we look at this text. It says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now that is a profound and, and far-reaching statement. If you're not a little child, you're never getting in the kingdom. That's, that's what it says. It, that we must become like that. Now we better, number one, find out what he means to be like a child. That's something that we need to know that's for sure. We need to know what we are and, and, and how we're to become to be able to enter into the kingdom. And this is a pretty narrow statement also. It's, it has a, a narrow view that it takes that childlikeness 
to be able to enter in. There's only one condition in this verse for entering into the kingdom, becoming like a child. Do you know what that means? Do you know, I mean, if someone asked you, well, the Bible says to become like a child, could you tell them what that means? Well, I hope that after we get through with, with this chapter that we'll be able to profoundly be able to define that statement. So let's work our way through this brief two verses. And the first thing that we need to look at is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we need to define it, what it is. Matthew uses it in a, in a phrase over 32 times because he is the one that preaches the kingdom of heaven. He deals with the king and his kingdom, uh, the greatness in that kingdom of heaven. They, they ask in verse number 1, he says, you have to be converted. Or verse number 3, he says, you have to be converted and become as a child to enter into the kingdom. Verse number 4, he, takes, he talks about the one who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Three times it is mentioned, the kingdom of heaven, in, in these uh, brief verses that we've read today. We've already seen in Matthew, uh, as he's covered this ground over and over again, uh, but we need to sort of go back and look at it again. Let me just say that it means the rim of God's rule is what the kingdom is in general terms. The rim of God's rule. It is, uh, uh, it is the same as saying the kingdom of God. Or synonymous as saying the kingdom of God. There's many scholars out there that will write books on the difference between the two. But really there is no difference. And I'm not going to go into the verses. But I will give them to you and you can look at them later. If you look in chapter 19 of Matthew and verse number 23, you'll find that, uh, that it is used there. And if you drop down, it is used in verse number 24. And it has, uh, uh, there, they have the same meaning, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. They use the same meaning there. So why the different titles? Well, very simply, the kingdom of God emphasizes the rule. The kingdom of heaven emphasizes the character of his rule. So we, we, they, they're still this meaning the same thing, but they're emphasizing different areas of that rule or that kingdom. It is God who rules that kingdom, and he rules it with the heavenly principles and power and majesty and blessings and opportunities of that which is given to his children here on earth. So what Jesus is t talking about is the kingdom of heaven. And so far as if it means the rule and reign of God, the dominion of God or the sphere, or the, uh, the fear, the sphere of, of uh, God's influence or God's power or God's rule. God bless. Uh, and the, and the blessings of God and the kingdoms to come of our Lord and coming into eternal life. That is what he's talking about in the, in the realm of the kingdom. It is being saved, being redeemed, belonging to God under his dominion. So the acceptance of the kingdom of heaven is simply means God remnant of rule now when we see this term kingdom of heaven in the book of matthew we we see it so many times and it has so many different focuses on that that one kingdom i mean the kingdom has a has a vast variety of things but it 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 
it focuses on certain different things throughout it. And we must determine uh, the facet by which uh, he is determining this or, or focusing on this. For example, if you were to look at chapter 25 and verse number 1, you would read, uh, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. And you would remember that uh, the virgins who had uh, lamps, five were ready and five were, were turned off and, or, or weren't ready. Now, there, there you have the kingdom of heaven related to the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. We're talking about the millennial reign. This is, a, this is an aspect of the kingdom of God that is being projected by the, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. So, we need to make sure that we understand that, 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 that he is, in, in this incident, in, in chapter 25, he is looking at the future 1,000 uh, year reign of Christ on the earth that is in view, as used as the kingdom of heaven. If you go back, for example, to the 11th chapter of Matthew and the 11th verse, it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, uh, were, uh, there were none risen as greater, uh, greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And there... It is talking about he, uh, the kingdom of heaven uh, really as a sort of a forward look of, a, of an eternal state. That the kingdom of heaven is our eternal state. And everyone that is in there is going to be greater than those who live on earth. It is, it is looking at it in the living matter. That those that are born here on earth... Those that, are, that receive Christ and are in the kingdom of heaven will be greater. Because heaven is eternal, the existence is greater than that earthly existence. So, we have the millennial reign that is, that is viewed in verse number 25 as the kingdom of heaven. And then we have the, uh, the eternal reign that is, that is looked at as the, in chapter number 11 as the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you look in chapter number 13, in chapter number 13, we find el uh, uh, other elements. In verse number 24 through 30, you remember you have the wheats and the tares that are there. And there it is talking about the kingdom of heaven is seen as true and the false. So it, it is describing the kingdom of heaven as the border beyond that which is saved and compasses not only that which is saved, but that which claims to be saved. It's also identi it's identifying with Christianity and, and those who claim to be Christians and are not. So it says the kingdom of heaven is likened unto this. So it's, it's, you, you can see that the aspects of kingdom of heaven that are given to us have to be determined. We have to determine what it is because if we don't determine what it is, then we'll never be able to, be, to understand it fully. This is why there's much misinterpretation of Scripture because they misappropriate what it's talking about. Just because it says the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean that it means the whole realm. doesn't mean that it means uh, once this, this, uh, this particular thing. And, it, and if you go through chapter 11, you, you see it with the, the tares and the wheats. Uh, you, <clears throat> you see it, what was the other one? Yeah, with the, with the uh, uh, mustard seed and the leaven. You, you see all these things describe the kingdom of heaven, but it's looking at a specific per, uh, part of the kingdom of heaven as it describes it. And it comes to the understanding. So these parables uh, speak of the person of the kingdom of heaven. 
So sometimes the kingdom of heaven can relate to eternity. Sometimes the kingdom of heaven can, can relate to the millennial earth. Sometimes the kingdom of heaven can be the influence of Christians on the, on, uh, on the, on the world. Sometimes uh, it can relate to the, 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 fear, uh, the, the whole uh, fear of Christianity, including those who are true and false believers. And sometimes it relates to the personal uh, appropriation of the kingdom. And that right there, you remember, is the ones where they went out to search for pearls. One found a field of great treasure, and, and he took it. And the other sold everything that he had and went and bought a great pearl. And that was personally. Now, as we, as we look at these, these uh, assets of the kingdom of heaven, uh, he, he has given us a, a general, general understanding of, of all that the kingdom is. So let us take just a, a few moments and, and uh, talk about that. Uh, when we know that we know that the that when he talks about the kingdom, he's talking about eternity. The the kingdom of heaven, because he says in verse number three, except thou be converted, he is he is talking about uh, the conversion or the acceptance. So we're we're looking at at the 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 acceptance of the kingdom of heaven in this passage of scripture and then that you must be like a child now it is important to for every person to understand that we must enter into this kingdom you know what that means that means that every person is born outside the kingdom of god there's no one born inside the kingdom of god Everybody is born outside the kingdom of God. And because of that, we must be converted. We must be converted. The gospel presents that a man may enter into this kingdom. I mean, it is, it is given that there's a way of entrance. As he gives this portion of scripture to us, he is making it known that there's none of us that, that has ever been born deserving. There's none of us that have ever merited entrance, that we must be converted. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. It must come through repentance. God wants the people, wants people in his kingdom. He doesn't want anybody in hell. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us <clears throat> that hell was not made for people it was made for the devil and his angels it wasn't even created for them i cannot ever get by with someone saying that god ordained people to go to hell it's not it's not like that now i want you to understand something i'm not i'm not so far on the other side that, that believes that that uh that you have you have all the ability to, to, to get into heaven by yourself either. No, I, I, one day I'm going to, I'm going to teach a, uh, a series of lessons on that and start from Genesis, and we're going to work our way through the Bible. But, but it's always been God's desire for people to enter into the kingdom. Jesus preached it. The apostles preached it. The, uh, John the Baptist preached it. They all preach the kingdom of God. They all preach that, 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 that God's desire was them to enter in. And that is exactly what our Lord is doing here. He is talking about entering into the kingdom. And the way that he phrases it is used three times in Matthew. Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 21, he uses that same phrase. Matthew chapter number 18 and verse number 3 uses it. And then again in chapter 19 and verse number 23. It simply means to become saved, to become redeemed, to become regenerated, to be born again into the kingdom of God's family. God's influence, God's rule. 
This is this this is is the this is um, comparative with uh, what what is given to us in John three sixteen or John chapter number three when when uh, when God describes being born again. He is describing to Nicodemus how to enter into the kingdom. But as we go through this, we'll see that, that, that God is, is, is revealing this to the disciples, but he wants them to be able to see, and he's been teaching them all along the way. Matter of fact, most people use the book of John to lead someone to the Lord a lot of times. But in, in reality, the book of Matthew has has laid out the gospel systematically and, and so carefully that that uh, it reveals how to enter into the kingdom of God even better than the message of John does. The message of John proves the deity of Christ. Matthew's message is to get you into the kingdom and to reveal who the king is. So... With that in mind, now, and, and I, I want you to get this right here because I, that is a fundamental foundation by which we must have. We must have before we proceed further because as we look at this, I want you to see that, that he, as he is talking about going into the kingdom, he is using it in the, in the understanding of entering into that or how to get into that kingdom. And we're going to look next week, not this week, we're going to look next week. And Matthew, starting back in the beginning and going through and seeing the gospel and how, through Matthew, we're saved. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll go into our business meeting. Father, I do thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray, God, that you'll help us as we, as we continue our study. Lord, I know that sometimes it feels like that we're in a classroom and there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of things that uh, are similar but, but need to be defined to that there be more clear understanding of the things to come. And Lord, I know that it's, it's difficult sometimes and not every sermon that's preached is that that is exciting and and heart thrilling but lord i pray that that you would help us to see the need of the hour and of this message lord that you prepare us for what we're 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 going to uh see and that uh that you would encourage us as we look into it as we see what it takes to be born again and lord we love you and thank you so much for all that you do and we ask these things in jesus name amen now we're going to, you can be seated if you, if you need to leave, we understand, but you're welcome to.